The following program may contain coarse language, violence, nudity, mature subject matter, or scenes which may not be suitable for all viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back, everyone. This is the X Zone. I am Rob McConnell coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. You can always reach me email xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And we're coming to you around the world tonight on the Talkstar Radio Network. Mutual Broadcast Network, and of course the Exxon Broadcast Network, and on channel number 57 on Simul TV on the Exxon TV channel. For more information about the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV, visit www.simultv.com. Exxon Nation, my guest this hour is Marlene Pelliser, and uh, we're going to be talking about the paranormal. She is a paranormal researcher since the 1990s. She's the author of a supernatural fantasy series, and she's also a hypnotherapist. Coming to us from Florida tonight is Marlene Pelliser. And Marlene, welcome to the Exxon. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you tonight. Oh, great having you, Wes. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you how you actually got into doing what you're doing. Well, um, as to put into context, and I use this as an example, I was doing it back in the 90s when you had to pay to develop film. And for a lot of people who are used to digital, find it hard to believe that once upon a time there was such a thing. So sure. I got involved in it almost not the way that you see nowadays with groups. It was mostly word of mouth. And of course, people, confidentiality was a big thing back then. They didn't want like somebody to drive up in a van with a bunch of equipment. Yeah. So it was very low level and uh, privacy was of the utmost. And usually in most cases, it was people that were really at their wits end. They had kind of gone through the list of anything that it could be before they had come to that point, including being turned away sometimes by clergy. Wow. Yeah, so they were like at the rope's end. And um, it was very hard for them to accept that it was, as a matter of fact, possibly something supernatural. And that's how I got started. And then there was, a, I joined a research foundation here that covered the state of Florida. And I just worked as a member, you know, freelance mostly, mm -hmm. um, investigation. Same thing, you know, privacy, confidentiality, professionalism. And that's, you know, you, word of mouth and you get to be known amongst other fellow investigators. And the rest is history, right? Exactly. So ha what kind of paranormal experiences have you had in your own life? Well, I, I tell everybody when, and it's because when sometimes when things happen to people, they don't realize what it is till they look back on it. Not everything is in your face, especially when you're a teenager, and which is what happened to me. One time when I was like 16 years old, I skipped school and I stayed home and I lived across the street from my grandmother. My mother told me, if you ever stay home, she would mm -hmm. leave to go to work before I did. Call your grandmother, let her know you're home. And I did. I, you know, the truth was I wasn't feeling sick. I just didn't feel like going to school. And I remember what woke me up was I heard rat, somebody rat, opening cupboards in the kitchen, which was at the front of the house. The bedroom was in the back of the house. The first thing that came to mind was it was my grandmother. And I was like, man, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> she's gonna grill me why i didn't go to school and i hear sure. you know when somebody's opening you know the drawer with utensils and opening and closing mm -hmm. the cupboards to be honest with you my grandmother had really bad arthritis in her knees she she had keys to the house but she never came to the house plus there was nothing we had that she needed but in that moment it was that's the first thing that came to my mind i didn't get scared who else would be going around in the kitchen and then it was one of those houses with a raised flooring, wooden flooring. And I hear somebody walking down the hallway towards the bedroom. And I was like, I remember I turned over, like put my back towards the door and I covered kind of like, I'm going to pretend to be asleep. I'm still thinking in my mind that it's my grandmother. And however, for some reason, and for somebody that's ever had this experience, I felt somebody come and stand in the doorway of the bedroom and look at me. But my grandmother was a very short lady. 
and it felt, and I don't, this is the best way to explain it, feel it, even though my back was turned to it, like whoever was looking at me from the doorway was tall. Wow. And then somebody came up and covered, put the, pulled the blanket over my shoulders. Like it was at my waist and they pulled. Okay, I stayed home, fast forward, my mom gets home from work. Usually what she would do is after five or 10 minutes, she'd go over and visit with my grandmother. Sure enough, five minutes later, the phone rings. My mom's calling me. Why didn't you tell your grandmother that you were there at the house, that you didn't go to school? I'm like, but she knew it. She was here this morning. I hear my grandmother in the background going, Shh, I wasn't there. I, that was not me. What is she talking about? She's lying. And I'm like, what? And I know my grandmother <laughs> had no problem of, if that was the case, saying, hey, I was there. Mm -hmm. And that was, I want to say, one of the earliest experiences I had that later on I realized, wow, you know. Um, and then after that, a couple of times I remember, uh, like, again, this was in the 80s, you know, when you would pull the corded phone and I'd be late at night talking on the phone. Oh, sure. And I, I, would used hear to, I used to do Yeah, I used to do that. <laughs> and I, I'd go into the closet. Yeah. It was like, how far can you stretch that cord, right? Exactly. And, yeah. um it was summertime, and of course, I was. It was light at night, and we had the jealousy. This is Florida, of course, South Florida. Jealousy windows were open, and I, my mom was asleep, and I heard somebody walking. A couple of times, I heard the chain link rent, uh, fence rattle, and I thought, you know, when you're a teenager, it's a cat, it's whatever. I, we didn't have a cat, by the way. I was just. Then a couple of times, I heard somebody walking around in the yard, and I was like, that is no cat. One of the times it got so bad that I woke up my mom and we're looking all through the windows. We had no trees, nothing in the yards for somebody. Plus, by the way, I'd grown up in this neighborhood. So I knew everybody in the neighborhood. They knew us. Nobody in the yard. That happened a couple of times where looking back on it, I must have scared the, you know, what out of my mom because she was that asleep telling her, hey, there's somebody in the yard walking around. We would look. There's nobody. Plus, you didn't hear anybody running off. And mm. again... Looking back, I think that um, I had lived across the street when an older couple used to live there. Well, they they brought up their daughter, and her husband died. Her daughter had moved off. She was the one that rented us the house. I'm thinking possibly, but without being sure, that it might have been her husband maybe hanging out. But I would say that would, that was my first experience that I could say was paranormal. Uh, something that I've often wondered is how can a ghost – or a spirit make noise if you can't I don't see know them. Idea. You know, like here you've got these footsteps outside, and here you are, a young lady. You're scared. You wake up your mom. You both look outside. Oh, yeah. There's nothing. There's and and it doesn't. How can I say it? And and I guess I've come across this from people I've interviewed later on investigations. People have experiences without expecting to have the experience versus when you're an investigator that you're looking for the moment or you're trying, you're, when you hear it, you dissect it. This is when you're not thinking it's paranormal. Uh, and so you don't question it. You don't think, well, how can that be? Or who's, you know, rattling around in my kitchen, opening mm -hmm. cupboards and um, you don't, you just later on is when you go, what? And that's, I would say sometimes that's really when you realize there was something more to this than just... You know, and I, by the way, I wasn't asleep. I was really awake because I was concerned that I had gotten busted for staying home from school. So tell me, did you ever skip school again? A couple of times. What can I say? <laughs> I was pretty good. I was pretty good. I was a real good. I, I went to Catholic school all the way to 12th grade. But uh -huh. every once in a while, it was like, I don't want to wear a uniform. And I want to, I just, I just want to stay home. But yeah, um, yeah, I, I have to admit that by the my senior year, I had like, <laughs> I said, I can't go through high school without skipping a couple of times at least. And of the thing not. was, it wasn't really skipping. It was just I wanted to stay home. So, yeah. Well, that's all That's all part of growing up now, isn't it? Yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. Listen, uh, in some of the notes that you sent us, uh, you talk about the Miami Ghost Chronicles. What are they? Right. So I started the group like in like 1998, 1999. And mostly I didn't, I, like I said, I was a freelance investigator. I never really brought on investigators with me. I would, I would accept cases and bring in other members from the research foundation, uh, into, that were into South Florida. And, uh, they would contact me again if they wanted me to do an investigation or after the last minute they needed a member because I was pretty good as far as showing up like on an emergency basis, especially when they had something planned. And one of the members just couldn't make it. 
So right. uh, Miami Ghost Chronicles, I would just put information about the investigations, about things that were going on. I would get a lot of emails about people wanting help. And if I couldn't help them, I would find a, some group through the Research Foundation that they could connect to as far as getting help. And I would get a lot of weir weird emails, by the way, of people just... Uh, and I, I have people sometimes have very weird experiences that they feel like, I wish I could tell somebody that will kind of believe me, even if it's in an email yeah. format. And I would get a lot of emails of people retelling me their experiences. And a lot of them would end like, I've never told anyone about this. So it's quite a responsibility to carry. When well, people it, come yeah, to you, you problems and, and they're pouring their heart out to you because no one else will listen. I think a lot of times they're either afraid of in the family, they're going to be, you know, it's that person, you know, yeah. like, you know, your family will never let you forget it or God forbid at work. It's, you know, a lot of times people really never disclose what they did for a living, but I'm sure sometimes people, the type of work they do is like, man, this is a career killer. If it gets out, you know, that I'm seeing dot, dot, dot. Sure. Um, so. All right, you and I have to take our first break. Please stand by and exclamation if you'd like to get more information about Marlene, visit www.miamighostchronicles.com. And Marlene and I will be back on the other side of this break. Whatever you do, don't go away. Do you enjoy paranormal sci-fi romance, yet find yourself tired of the same old themes and storylines? Then you won't want to miss Kahir O'Donnell's latest exciting release, To Taste You Again. Alien Lord Kane McKean knew the moment that his destined mate was born. He watched from afar, waiting for her to grow from child to woman. However, before she was old enough, she was stolen from her home world by flesh pirates. Kane searched ten long years to find her held in a suspension chamber a ten-year-old girl in a woman's body. He rescued her and swore to give her time to grow up, but with his very life depending upon winning her as a mate, has he waited too long? Get your copy today. To Taste You Again by Kahira O'Donnell is now available on Amazon or kahiraodonnell.com. We're talking about the paranormal this hour here in the Exxon. Marlene Palliser is our special guest, and her website is MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Marlene, what's the what is the supernatural or the preternal world? Preternal natural world or preternal natural world? Preternatural, supernatural. Yeah, I've heard it explained as in supernatural is more on the natural side where the preternatural if you want to look at it is maybe more on the malevolent side even though i think for most people you'll say the supernatural and most people think of it as paranormal or ghostly something that falls under that umbrella um something outside you know it implies it's something out of the norm for us even mm -hmm. though that definition changes quite a lot as far as what's normal or natural um even what we're finding out with uh, studies into physics, et cetera, can explain a lot of supernatural occurrences. What's the difference between human and non-human entities? Oh, that's a loaded question. Okay. I use that because I think that the word demon is overused. It's a loaded word. Mm -hmm. um, and in my experience, I have found that there are entities out there which are non-human, have never been human, but are, don't fall into the demonic. They're non-human. Uh, they could be elemental spirits. Uh, they could be um, something that it's difficult to categorize because sometimes I think that there's different ones out there, but uh, they don't fall into what we think of as demons related to hell, satanic, uh, hellish, or anything like that. By the way, I'm not saying that they're good or bad. As a matter of fact, you have to be really careful with this type of entity because their moral compass is not like ours. Or you know how people try to make uh, either when they invoke into uh, dark, uh, if you want to say dark spirits, that they wanted to make a bargain. 
uh, sometimes non-human entities, they, they don't want to bargain. They're not into bargaining. They don't care. They, they don't hate us and they don't love us. It's You have to be really careful with non-human entities when you look at it from that aspect as in not demonic because you're usually so, so very ancient. Spir- I'm sorry. So ahead. why do these spirits hang around? Why don't they just go wherever spirits are supposed to go? Are we talking here like human spirits, like dead people? Human. Okay, well, I'm, gonna, I'm, going, in general. I'm going to say that in my experience that I've found, and by, since I've never been dead, I've never even had a near-death experience. My experience I have found that with, let's go with human spirits, okay. is number one, sometimes you will have people that pass away and they don't recognize or they don't realize or want to accept that they're dead. They either died suddenly, mm-hmm. did died under the effects of drugs, they were in some type of anesthetic. Um, in other words, the moment that of death came and went and they missed it. And they come to and they're self-aware and maybe in their minds they think of being dead as how can I still be self-aware? But they can't quite figure out why nobody sees or hears them. And that's why sometimes they're attracted to people that have some type of intuitive or you know, psychic abilities. Uh, you have others that are afraid Sometimes they into the hell and heaven aspect. Even if they right. weren't religious, they remember mm-hmm. this. And maybe if they weren't, sometimes they really were not good people. And sometimes people, you know, how can I say they they're very unforgiving of themselves. Bottom line, they're afraid that they're going to go to hell, so they hold back on this plane in the in between, thinking if I go, I'm going to go to the hot place. Um, and sometimes it's what motivates us as humans. Love, revenge, anger, materialism, you know, you want to hang on to the earthly goods. That point where you you realize, I don't need this. I don't need the house. I don't need the clothes. I don't need possessions because I don't have a body anymore. They don't go there. They still care about the things that we care about as living beings. So they kind of hold back and don't progress. Some of them are aware that they're, they've passed on. Others are not. And like I said, and others sometimes as all they want to do is somebody to recognize or for them to say something that they thought should be said. All right. And something as simple as that can hold them back. Is it also possible that the desires of the of the family or the loved ones yes. can hold the spirit back as well? Absolutely. And they... Um, I have found, um, and I did this also when I did the hypnotherapy work, and it's, I can, how can I say this? It's difficult to tell this to somebody who's grieving, who's freshly in pain. But, you know, you I'm sure you've heard of people that will say to a, a departed, really, don't leave me, stay with me. Oh, how sure, could yeah. you have done that? Yeah. Well, sometimes they, you know, they hang out for a few days before they transition, and they they want to comfort the living they see the desperation especially when this person is saying don't leave me how could you leave me stay here with me and for examples i've heard of widows widowers which will say this and this their their dead spouse hangs out two or three years down the road when they're over that fresh pain all of a sudden they find they have a problem on their hands because they still have their deceased spouse hanging out with them and getting in the way because let's face it once you're dead, this is no place for you. You're, you're, you're going to end up unhappy and frustrated to be on the earth plane. This is not the place for you. Out of the, How can I say it? Out of the presence of the divine is not good for a human soul. How does one's religious beliefs play in the, in the acknowledgement or the investigation of a paranormal event? Well... If you know what they are, because um, usually you would think it it, it does, and it, you'd be surprised. There's people that aren't religious, but if they had some type of teachings when they were children, mm-hmm. it, they do, it comes into play. Um, especially if they think they violated some of the rules of that religion, whatever they might be. Okay, whether Judeo Christian or anything else. Right. Um, sometimes you go into an investigation, you have no idea really who it is and i've learned that you know the usual suspects sometimes aren't who it is because 
a lot of times you will go to places where they will tell you, oh, this, whatever tragedy happened, whatever, who they think it is. Sometimes a lot of things go around, especially if it's a little bit, a few years before, mm -hmm. where you have tragedies and things happen and you know how almost like a gothic novel things that that is done secretly in the night that could be who the source of the haunting is coming from so yes absolutely it does figure if if you know who you're talking about what was the most significant paranormal investigation that you, that you've done oh let me see okay uh boy i'm thinking of all the ones i've done and like I said, there's some that uh, after the fact, I want to say there was one where um, I heard somebody coming up. I was, we were in an empty, this was an older home made of wood. Uh, it was kind of almost empty. Uh, and it was uh, one of these older homes where the stairway is narrow, the hallways are narrow. It's, I want to say it was maybe 80 to 100 years old. Uh, mm -hmm. And everything was made of wood and I was upstairs it was two bedrooms upstairs and I remember I was sitting up there and like I said this was pre with all the gadgets that they have now I had just a camera which really wouldn't have worked much because I had turned off all the lights all we had was ambient lighting I was upstairs by myself and I had a recorder and I was just wanting to see if something was going to manifest and um, I was there was since there was no place to sit I was sitting on the floor against one of the frames of one of the doorways of the rooms and the, uh, the staircase was right behind me. And all of a sudden, you know, you hear, I hear somebody coming up the stairs. And what I'm positive are, is are in bare feet. And the tread was, it, it didn't sound like a man, it, uh, like a heavy person, in other words. Mm -hmm. It either had to be a woman, a slight woman, or a child. And it was one of those that, yeah, I want to. I call it like the horror movie moment. At some point, it's going to reach the top of the stairs right behind me. Am I going to turn around? And it was like, okay. And I hear it come up. And first of all, there was other investigators downstairs, but nobody would have gone up the stairs without having told me I'm coming up the stairs because that defeats the purpose. Plus, it, they were in bare feet. It was like, and then I just kind of like did one of these and then just something flew. It was a very short hallway that ended basically in a wall. Something just flew like in the darkness past me and right into the wall. It didn't even give me time for me. I just saw it out of my peripheral vision to the side mm -hmm. and it flew. Whatever it was just disappeared into the wall at the end of that short hallway. And then I was like, okay. And at that point, contrary to what you see in some of these shows, you don't stop there and start trying to listen to your recording. This is something that you do after the fact, especially when you're in that moment. And um, I want to say uh, this is where you, for lack of a better word, as an investor, you put your big girl pants on. And I said, okay, let me stay up here. And um, th this room was empty that I was sitting in. There was some closets and there was a, a bed frame uh, propped up against the uh, one of the walls. That was it. It was empty. And I was sitting catty corner, and in that there was a window, and um, there was it was a dark corner. And all of a sudden, I started smelling, you know, that ionized smell that you get right before it rains. And I'm thinking, yeah, this, yeah, like that, you know, when it's gonna rain. And I was like, first of all, normally before we went on investigation, we would check the weather report just to find out what to expect. Number two, I could look out the window and I could see that it was clear outside. I knew it wasn't gonna rain. Plus, I could see out the window. And it, by the way, this is at nighttime in the evening and I can see it's clear. And then I'm smelling this. And I'm like, what in the world? And I know that there's nothing up there. And then out of the darkness in that corner, that caddy corner, it's across from me. I see like, um, it looks from the beginning, it looks like the shoulders and the head. And I really couldn't tell if it was male or female. I could tell though that it, it was an adult. It wasn't a child because of the height, uh, unless it was like a teenager, mm -hmm. comes up out of the darkness, all right? And I must have shifted or something or made something, and it actually turned and looked at me by the shadow. You could tell by the movement. It, be, it was aware of me, and it just b did almost the same thing I seen in the hallway into the closet that was right next to it. 
And Holy I was cow. like, yeah. And that was like, uh, you know, it, and it happened so quickly. And more than anything, what I thought was most intriguing was that it became, it was aware of me. When it turned its head like, and looked at me because I, I can't remember if I shifted or so, I did something that made it look to where I was sitting down at the other corner on the other end of the room. All right. We're going to have to have a cliffhanger here. I've got to take a break. And when we come back, the continuation of this very spooky story, Marlene is our special guest, Mar Marlene Palliser, and her website is miamighostchronicles.com. I'm Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. Don't go away. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens and they kept repeating to me over and over again, simultv.com, simultv.com. What's simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night. I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, Sonny Boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, Sonny Boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Welcome back, everyone. Marlene Pelletier is our special guest. Her website is MiamiGhostChronicles.com. All right, so here you are. You're, you're in this building. You're on the top floor. You've kind of got yourself wedged in a doorway. Am I correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the stairs are behind you? Right. It, it was, like I said, it was an older home where the stairs hug yeah. the side of a wall. Mm -hmm. And it ends up at the beginning of the hallway. And it comes down and there's a, door, you know, a room on either side. Yeah. So I was sitting on the doorway, on the frame, with my back to, like, that doorway came up behind me. And after that, and then, <laughs> it was one of those that, um, for lack of a better word, it's surprising how much happens when it's kind of quiet and when you observe. And the reason why I bring this up is that you, you see in a lot of these shows, they have all these cameras and the fleer and the this and the, you know, the little square. And, and yeah. um, one of the things that... Uh, that I do want to bring up, Rob, which is the best instrument that there is, is the human body. Once you get to trust oh, I it. Ag I agree with you 100%. There's just something about the human body that once you mm -hmm. attenuate it, you like you know what you're feeling. It'll yeah. give you a heads up a lot sooner than any piece of equipment. And uh, it sure will. that's it sure overlooked will. sometimes. I think that people are using these instruments way too much and they're not using their own God-given senses. Yeah. You know, plus it makes it good for TV. And I think that well, a lot of the TV, a lot of the TV shows are misleading. Yes, they are. Very they are. I, and I understand it's for TV. No, I know. I understand. But, I, it's, 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 you have to entertain yeah. if, you know, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest yeah. with you. There's some investigations that's like, you know, <laughs> they're not gonna. Exactly. Well, it's, it's just like police work. I was in law enforcement for many okay. years. And when you go on a stakeout, it's not like it is on TV. You're not sitting there for two minutes or three minutes and, you know, the robbers break into the place that you're under, you know, you're watching. It yeah. could take days. It could take a couple of days. And I've even seen it where a stakeout has taken weeks. Mm -hmm. So yeah. once again, you have, when people watch these shows, they have to, they have to realize that when number one, it's, you know, it's, it's for entertainment. And number two, a lot of the stories are coming out from cast members and former production people that, sure. you know, so most of it is all fake and propped and, 
Yeah. But th- this place that you were at, mm-hmm. what were you initially there? Why were you called in? It was somebody that it was an older home, and I think mm-hmm. it had been a uh, some. It, it had been empty for a while, and somebody wanted to move in, but it kind of had a reputation already. And I think, right. if I remember correctly, because I, w- I was brought in on the tail end of the investigation, mm-hmm. where they had already had some type of prior experience living in a place that was haunted, and they were like, "Hey, go in there before we move in." Ah, so and so they find were predest- out. They were predestined. To the possibility that the house was Yes, haunted. yes. Uh-huh. And they were like, we're not even moving our stuff in. Wow. Go in there. And and we've even gone to investigations where people want to make sure something follows them. Follow them. They were moving out of state. And I've done investigations where it's been the other way around. They don't want to be followed. Mm. So, um, yeah, there's nothing like that experience. And that's why I say sometimes people think that ghosts are exciting. Unless you're involved in a really serious uh, haunting it's not yeah. fun anymore. It's like, no, it's not like you think, oh, it's how exciting. Mm-hmm. It, it could be a real um, pain in the neck, and that's to put it lightly. Okay, so so was this investigation done at night or during the day? At night. It was at Why night. Why are it, investigations done at night instead of during the day? Um, how can I say it? I remember that we got there like late afternoon, uh, like, mm-hmm. like in, towards the evening, and it's one of those things where – you're hoping, okay, we're going to sit here and we're going to see what we could capture daytime and it goes into the evening. And right. for some reason also, uh, it, 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 and how can I say it? Sometimes, and this is what I found that some people don't realize this, if you have a haunting that has to do with human spirits, people sometimes in death will follow the pattern that they used to in life depending on what their lifestyle were, where sometimes the activity in the house happens at the time that people are normally in the house, in the evenings, at night, as far as they're following some type of loop of activity. Uh, like Just like you, you'll have people that will say in certain places, especially the older ones, oh, at a certain time of morning, real early, we'll smell coffee brewing or mm-hmm. you know something being baked in the evening sometimes if you get that type of thing it's almost just to see what happens and since it was empty we really weren't sure what we were looking for you know was this just a place that had a bad reputation but there was nothing to it or what exactly we were going to find so so what happened uh, how did you we um as far case? as i know we um we asked them, do you know, this is what we, you know, afterwards, you know, I went downstairs. I was like, you're not going to believe in there. Everybody's looking at me like, what? And, um, and we, because uh, see, this is the thing. You don't, you can't always assume that people want to, for lack of a better word, exercise or bless the place that you have to speak to. And we said, look, this is what's happening. Um, we could do a blessing for you. But really, we suggest that since you haven't moved in, why don't you get clergy out here to bless the place? I really didn't, um, and, and they had, they, there really wasn't, I, it, nobody had done any type of history as to who it could be. It could have been anybody, really, as far as who was there. Um, and uh, they they said, okay, you know what, they were going to get clergy to bless it. And we said, look, if you want us, we'll come right back out. We showed them, I told them what I had seen, and they kind of looked at me with these big eyes like, huh? And, um, and I know they were going to renovate the house. They were going to do a bunch of things to it but we never heard from them again. So I'm going to assume that after they got the house blessed, whatever it was, got resolved. Because normally you will hear back from people, especially the ones that say, well, okay, oh, it's okay. We're going to have the ghost live with us. That's okay. We don't want them to kick them out. And then they call you back six, seven months, eight months, a year, and they're like, hey, you know, can you come back out here? Because things have gotten a little bit ugly. How long does normal investigation take? The foundation I used to work with, they first they would send out a scientific team, which is non-psychic. All it was to take temperature readings, find out what's what, is look at it from a scientific point. And if they found that there was possibility of something paranormal or supernatural, then, then they would do a follow-up, which is a, more of a psychic and to see, okay, we're going on the premise that there might be something supernatural here. Uh, also, the... You have to understand sometimes, you know, you will have persons that have mental illnesses that they say they're experiencing certain things and they're not. Uh, that, By the way, that doesn't exclude it that from being haunted either. I hate to say it, but 
it, it gives you an idea of what to expect. So usually it was like a two-part thing um, at the very minimum, depending on what was going on and what they wanted to have done. I've had investigations where people were very had to be happy to be told that they had a ghost there and just leave it alone. Okay, oh, oh, really? That's great. That was, by the way, more recent times after, you know, all the paranormal shows had come out. And I'd be like, okay, it's your house. <laughs> sure. Uh, but, yeah, after you've been doing that for a while, you realize that's not a wise choice. How many investigations do you do during a year? Oh, I haven't done some in a long while, but. Really? It was, um, God, sometimes it was really funny because sometimes they would stack up mm -hmm. and then we'd go through sometimes 10, 20 a year. Um, uh, a lot of times, like I said, I wasn't part of the original team, but somebody would beg out. Sometimes since, you know, I'm bilingual, they would need somebody that spoke Spanish. So I would help them in if they had any type of, um, Afro-Caribbean uh, religious practices like voodoo, santeria, uh, that was that they felt was part of the household or was in the house, they would ask me to, you know, go into with the team. Uh, so like I said, we would go through months where nothing happened and then I'd be, we'd be slammed. I don't know, sometimes we'd be like, you know, what what is it? What time of the year is it? Is there something going on? Um, yeah, that, that's it's, an interesting point. Is there a special time of the year when it seems ghosts are more active? I would say, um, looking back, not really, not that I could remember, no Look, thinking of a pattern that I would say, okay, these are the months where we get, that where we get a lot of calls. Um, and in being in Florida, you know, because sometimes you'll have people that say, you know, where where maybe there's a, the, there's a winter and people spend more time indoors. So all of a sudden they're experiencing mm -hmm. more of the indoors. And in Florida, the, we really don't go by where you're shut in the house because it's snowing outside. So, you know, um, I would say, and I know a lot of people say, no, there's nothing to it. I do, I do believe that there were tie-ins to the full moons. Just like you'll ask anybody that's working in an emergency room. Yeah. That they sure. see an uptick. Uh, as far as uh, not just cases, crazy cases roll into the emergency room. Yeah, I, I was enough because we would also, besides the weather, we would look at the phases of the moon. And I, we Smart. did see, find a correlation um, to the moon phases as far as the full moon. Something happened uh, that was going on, which drove. And, I, and at this point, I really couldn't say how it worked. But yeah, yes. So what are the dangers, if any? of someone who doesn't prepare themselves during an oh. investigation or if they go to a, a seance or if they use a Ouija board, how dangerous is this? Very dangerous. Okay. Very dangerous. Now, let me explain. I'm sure you've seen some of these places, some of these shows where they do the provocation, the confrontation, and et cetera, yeah, et cetera. Like I think they're idiots. Yeah. Well, the thing is this, that sometimes, and this is something that you find, is that you could go into an investigation and you could have a human spirit and you could have something malevolent, mm -hmm. non-human, demonic, whatever you want to call it, in the background. All right. Now, usually, especially if, even if it's an elemental, and they will look at that as a, let's say, without, let's, let's put the Ouija board out of the thing, the confrontation. They see that as an invitation. All right. And that's, you know how you have that Dracula theme, it can't come in your house unless you invite it. Yeah. Sometimes all these entities are looking for is that invitation. And the invitation for them will be when you do the confrontation or that you like, try to get in their face. And this is the thing, people don't realize, they don't, sometimes they don't take you up on that invitation right then and there. They could take up you up on that invitation a month later a year later, two years later. That's why you sometimes have people that will start having supernatural or paranormal activity in their houses. Uh, and they have no idea where it's stemming from. I've had investigators that didn't know what they were doing, that did confrontations with um, non-human entities, because at this point, one of them, we really weren't sure. They got a, an attachment that was very, very difficult to break, really difficult. And the reason why I say this, is that they don't want to, there's no bargaining you can make with them. It's not like, hey, or it's, it's, it's a very out of our realm kind of way of how to handle things. 
Right. Um, so, yes, I, I would say that for somebody that doesn't know how to protect themselves or mm -hmm. even, let's say, with a Ouija board, uh, same thing. Uh, sometimes people think, well, if I'm not the one putting my fingers on the planchette and I'm off in the corner, and I would say, you know, and, you know, especially with people that at some point had had problems with activity in their home, we'd tell them, look, don't go to no seances or anything. Oh, because somehow or other, this thing lures them in. And I said, because even if you're in the corner watching it, you're going to get targeted. Because I hate to say this, once you're earmarked, you're earmarked for life. Marlene, you and I have to take our final break for this hour, so please stand by. And explanation, if you'd like to find out more about Marlene, or maybe you would like to contact her to tell her a story, or because your home is haunted and you're in the Miami area, you're in Citra, Florida, I believe. Now. Yes. And yes. all you need to do is go to her website, Miami ghostchronicles.com this is the exxon i'm rob mcconnell we'll be back as we wrap up this hour here in the exxon and coming up in our next hour we have lance daniel from u.s psi squad hmm. ghosts physical bump of the night and much more still to come don't go away To be accosted in her bed and abducted by aliens was the last thing Michelle expected. Yet the fateful morning of her destined death changed everything. Lord Lan Ramos, Alpha King of Vidar, the monstrous befanged alien looming over her bed, was her destined mate come to save her from certain death. He is a telepathic mute shifter. Can Michelle accept him and his animal? Once on Lan's home planet, Michelle becomes increasingly psychic, revealing her as the fabled Oracle of Vidar. As factions conspire to destroy them, will they overcome mounting threats? Will Michelle's growing gifts save them or ultimately destroy her? Don't miss this sci-fi shifter romance with charismatic and engaging characters. Get your copy today, The Oracle of Vidar, available on Amazon or kahiraodonnell.com. That's C-A-H-I-R-A-O-D-O-N-N-E-L-L.com. Welcome back, everyone. Marlene Pelliser and I are back. Marlene is uh, she's a paranormal investigator. She is a hypnotist, and she's also an author. And in fact, she has a new book that's just come out called The Phantoms of the Follies. Tell us about your new book. Well, this book, it's really interesting. This uh, took place uh, about 100 years ago, and I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the Ziegfeld Follies that you know came out sure. like yeah. around the 1960s and 17s. And I started, believe it or not, I started this book out writing just an article and it just morphed into a book <laughs> because the more I researched it, I was so intrigued because what happened was back then, if you became a Ziegfeld Follies girl, you had it made. You were rubbing elbows with millionaires and so on and so forth. But it's incredible how many of these girls, despite uh, this fast paced, luxurious life, ended up dying prematurely, tragically to the point that even back then, it was considered almost like, is there a curse in being a Ziegfeld Follies girl? That was how often mm -hmm. these girls would end up tragically. Some made it, by the way. Barbara Stanwyck mm -hmm. was a uh, Stanfield uh, was a Ziegfeld Follies girl. Marion Davies. Uh, some actresses went on to become famous actresses, but others. And when that's what the book is about. The story does start out that the New Amsterdam Theater, which was where the Ziegfeld Follies started out in New York. Um, it, in the 30s, the review was over, and later on, it became like a movie house, and then it just became this, you know, fell into disrepair. And then, I think it was in the 90s that Disney bought it over and they renovated it. But there's a sighting of a ghost in that theater, and they've said that it, it's Olive Thomas, which was a very famous uh, Ziegfeld girls, which died she under mysterious circumstances, but very young. But when you go into the stories that are right about in the book, you can see there's a bunch of these girls that were, by the way, were just as beautiful as Olive, which makes you think it could be Olive, but it could be a lot of other girls who by the, the, the and New Amsterdam Theater really was the point where they were the happiest or at least had the most attention. But it was, a, it, this was the time of uh, prohibition, um, you know, the jazz age, the flappers, 
uh, you know, you had gangsters rubbing elbows with millionaires. It's a really interesting time. A lot of things going on. Um, and a lot of these girls, by the way, were also died not only tragically by their own hand, but were also murdered because of who they who they were running around with. You know. Wow. So yeah, so that's how long what did that it take about. you to write? How long did it take you to write your book? I want to say like two, almost three months. Uh, like I said, I started just, I was just going to do, I just initially was going to do an article about the haunting of the New mm -hmm. Amsterdam theater, about the Olive Thomas thing. And then when I started researching, I was like, wait, it could be Olive, but it could be, what is this? And I'm looking at all these girls, all right, which by the way, people don't realize back then, they would start as early as 14, 15, 16 years old. These were different times. Uh, as far as how young they would start out there. Some of them were a little bit older. Some even went to university. Others uh, would go in there. And Whoops. What happened? Did we lose our guest? I don't know. Marlene, are you there? Marlene, can you hear us? Craig, uh, try using a different angle on the on the system yeah try that oh, no that's me try it on her yes craig is telling me that we lost our guest well uh some of these things happen when you start talking about the paranormal people will tell you that oops are we back there we are yeah where did you go i don't know i must have <laughs> As long, I see what happens when you start dimension. talking about paranormal sometimes. It, I know it does. I know. Paranormal like saying, sabotage is what I call it. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, listen, though, we've got to say so long in a, in a very short while. Love to have you back on to continue sure. the story because I want to talk to you about sure. UFOs. I want to talk to you about cryptids, sure. other dimensions, and so on. But for now, Marlene, what are your final thoughts? What words like would you like to share with the Exxon Nation tonight? Well, I, I want to say that as far as um, a lot of what's considered the paranormal, what do you, whether you want to call it ufology, ghosts, uh, psychic, you know, I, th mm -hmm. I think a, a lot of it, even though people think it's different camps, really what I found is they're all intertwined some way or other. Okay, for example, UFOs, cryptids, ghosts. If you talk to anybody in that feels that tracks activity, you see that sometimes there's a combination of upticks of sightings and paranormal experiences that let you know these things are not isolated uh, in and of themselves. Because I know there's a lot of people that say if you're into Bigfoot, hey, I don't, you know, I don't believe in ghosts and that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. In my experience, that's far from the truth. I, they're they're well, all it, somehow blended. It seems funny because a lot of the UFO researchers now are are combining their information, their sightings data with Bigfoot. And there mm -hmm. seems to be a correlation that is starting to come yes. to the uh, come to the surface. Right, and and you know I've heard of the theory. Are we talking, um, you know, are we talking interdimensional travel for these UFOs, yeah. and they're punching a portal, a rip in the dimension, and are these cryptids slipping through, or are they, you know, working with? I mean, I've heard various theories with the uh, uh, extraterrestrials, or are they just slipping through because there's that portal that's open, and they kind of slip in and out of it. All right. There's a lot of theories, but yes, I've, I've heard of an uptick in UFO sightings. And then you also, on the other side, all of a sudden there's of sightings, not only Bigfoot, different types of cryptids. By the way, when I come back, you, you would be surprised as a hypnotist, what I had people confess to me as far as seeing cryptids, people contacting me to be hypnotized to forget. Because if wow. you want to talk about people that can't handle the truth of what mm -hmm. they saw, believe it or not, people that were like they could that that reality did not jive for them at all all right marlene we'll have you back in the very near future but for now let our listeners know how they can contact you okay they can go to miamighostchronicles.com or mppellister.com all right and they can find me there i also have a substack article that i release two or three times a week and that's the best way because usually i put on there articles you know like i'm releasing the book sometimes i'll mm -hmm. probably have a giveaway for this last book that's coming out in amazon and usually i announce it through my uh, substack uh, articles on things like that marlene thank you very much for joining us a pleasure talking to you and i look forward to 
when you come back and tell us more stories here in there. Absolutely. Until then, be safe and be well. Likewise. Take care. Bye-bye now. Exo Nation, once again, if you'd like to find out more information about our guest this hour, Marlene Pelliser, www.miamighostchronicles.com. That's it for this hour. I will be back at the top of the hour when our guest is going to be Lance Daniel. We're going to be talking about paranormal ghosts and a lot more as the Exxon continues right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, and on Channel 57 on Simul TV, which is the Exxon TV channel. Don't go away. Mm-hmm.